and there it is. The countdown has happened. So I'm I'm very excited to talk to major champion winner in golf channel analyst miss karen stubbles karen thank you very much for coming on the show i think we'll have a lot of fun i am too i'm looking forward to it very much thanks for having me you know as i was doing a little bit of homework on you and and this is one of the questions i usually wait till close to the end to ask and and it's something to the effect of you know what's a a passion or something that you really really enjoy that know that that somebody might not know about and and one thing that i found out on you and some of the homework and the people (laughs) i've talked to was um you have a a passion and you are like the van gogh of the grass (laughs) Uh, world. So <laughs> I guess I, I, I should lead in by asking you a little bit about Well, that. I don't know if I could be classed as a Van Gogh because I don't exactly have a perfect canvas to uh, to paint on out here. I, mean, I, I just have a lot of it that needs a lot of mowing. Um, mm-hmm. I do really enjoy uh, cutting grass. I like the, I guess it's taking something that looks so scruffy and unkempt and, and making it look nice and neat. And I think, you know, the correlation between people who play golf and people who like to cut grass are, are very similar. I mean, we, we like to perfect our golf swings and we like to turn something that in our eyes is, is quite scruffy and, and, uh, and, and, it's, and in some cases ugly looking to, to our own eyes and making it as pretty as you can make it. And so I don't play an awful lot of golf anymore, but I do like to mow the grass and I like to make it look as pretty as I can. And there's something really therapeutic about watching it all, all turn out quite, quite nice and riding the mower and listening to my tunes and singing as loud as I can when nobody can hear me because the mower is making enough noise. So it's not like I'm killing anybody, anybody's ears or anything. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can relate because I, when I was a kid and I worked at, at golf clubs as I was very similar to you started in a caddy yard when I was yeah. a kid. And then, you know, you, you worked the bag drop and your assistant and I, I used to volunteer to go pick the driving range for the same reasons that you could get away from everybody yes. back then. You know, we had Walkman. So you, you put your Walkman in your, cassette in and you just play it and you can as you said you can sing as loud as you want to and because of the the motor nobody's going to hear what you're saying (laughs) those those yeah so those walkmans were brilliant but they they were also a curse too because you always had a few songs on that tape that you wanted to get back to but you couldn't rewind it fast Mm -hmm. enough you had to have patience to get back (laughs) to it It used to drive me nuts (laughs) so with your skill on, on the mower would you be considered the what what would your classification be at the TPC of Beer Run? Would it be superintendent? Would it be general manager, director of golf? <laughs> director of everything apart from beer sales. Because <laughs> that, <'cause> that <laughs> distinction goes to somebody else. <laughs> I thought that was the coolest thing in the world when I read that. And I said, God, the next time I'm in Orlando, I'm, I'm, whether you guys are home or not, I'm just going to drop in. Yes. And, you know, I'll, I'll bring I'll bring the beer. I know Jerry loves his yes. beer. And I, I'll bring that as, as my uh, entry fee. But I, I got to come. Play your golf well, that we've had we had a little side note to to the golf course. So obviously, COVID happened. We we put the, a few little holes around the lake out back and had some fun with that. Uh, but in the process, my son decided to grow up a little bit and become good at baseball. So one of the golf holes mm-hmm. has now become a batting cage. So so you could uh, you could <laughs> take a few swipes with a with a baseball bat if you want to. So it's a bit of a cult, multi-use fine. land back there. Very cool. So you, you, I mean, if you add some go karts and maybe an arcade, it'd be like the eighties. Oh my god, that would be so much fun. Go karts. We've got a little circular drive out front. You could definitely do it around there. Jerry would be all about that. Very cool. So as we discussed early on, I mean, you, you, you are a major winner, and you, you are the high. You know, I, I've not had any I've had tour winners on. I've had uh, very uh, celebrities, uh, so mm-hmm. to speak. You know, Jerry's been on, Mark Lai's been on, a whole bunch of people, but I've never had a major golf winner. And I'm very curious to talk to you about that because it's something that I never even got close. I, I didn't even get my tour card, so I fell far short of that. Um, but uh, I, I, I guess in, in looking at, at your career and, and things that you have done, I, I would like to start there and almost go backwards. Sure. If that's okay. So, um, and, and you started off in a, in a very interesting fashion in, in, in your win with, uh, I believe it was an eagle and an yep. albatross. Can you, that's got it. I mean, do you get more nervous at that point or does that set you in a state of calm that, that, that really helped propel you for the rest of that? I think, you know, people ask me a lot about, you know, that final round. And honestly, what I remember about it was not being particularly nervous standing on the first tee. I think I was excited about playing golf. I had a, a really good game plan in my head. I knew I had to get off to a fast start. There was, 
it was a par five, par five start at Sunningdale. So I knew I had to get off the fast start. I was one shot back. And in order to kind of catch up with people, I had to at least eagle one of those first two because I knew that everybody else was going to birdie them. So I thought, I've, I've got to get off to a quick start. And I think I was so focused on the job at hand that, that I really didn't pay much attention to what was going on. Managed to get the eagle down the first. Okay, I'm like, okay, great. That's job done. Second hole, I hit a good tee shot. And then I hit, hit my target with the second shot. And it was kind of blind. And as it went over the hill, the crowd's clapping. And then it gets louder and it gets louder. And then it goes absolutely nuts. And of course, I can't see where it goes. And so the on-course commentator was a lady called Maureen Medill who worked for the BBC. And she, she does some, some radio stuff now over here. I think she was working for um, the, the radio um, for the PGA Championship just this, this past few weeks. And um, mm -hmm. so did it go in? And she's like, yes. And then, of course, I go crazy. So now I'm five under par. And uh, my caddy, uh, you know, he, he just turns to me and says, let's just go out and shoot a 59. And I think that kind of gets you into that attacking mindset that as opposed to kind of sit back and wait for it to, you know, to, to try and not to let it go away. You, you know, you, you keep on the attack. And I literally felt like I could make every single shot I stood over that day. Like I was, it was, you know, if it was going to go in the hole, if it was a five iron, I'm going to hole it. If it's a wedge, I'm going to hole it. If it's a putt, I'm going to hole it. Like I just felt so, I don't know, I was so excited about hitting the ball because it was coming out of the sweet spot all the time like I just knew it was going to happen mm -hmm. and it, I was seeing it and it was happening I was in that zone and uh and it's just a really magical place to to play in because you, you, you don't care about the score you don't care about what's going on around you because the feel of the shot as it's coming off the club face is exactly what you want it's exactly what you've been playing for it's there's an excitement to that feel uh, that is that that takes you away from the pressure of actually doing it. And uh, because it's just, I can't wait to get that feeling again. And I couldn't wait to get to the next shot. I'm like, come on, let's hurry up. I can't wait for the next one. And I carried that all the way around till I get, got to about the, well, I guess it was the 15th, 15th hole, which was a par three. And there was a stop. There was a delay. There was a group in front needed a ruling. And I stood there on the tee and I, and I look over and I realized that Prince Andrew's standing there. And then, the, the, the tournament sponsor standing there. And I think, and it took me a while to register, but I'm like, wait a minute, I have a one shot lead. And I'm, I'm really close to the end. I could win the British Open. And then it kind of all flooded in and it kind of all hit me. And I got really nervous. I'm like, for the first time, I stood on that 15th team. I thought, ah, I'm nervous. And uh, I managed mm -hmm. to, I, it was, I was between clubs and it was either a seven word or it was a four iron into this par three, 15 was par three. And I thought, I, I think I'll just kind of ease a little seven wood in there. And luckily I kind of necked it a little bit, caught it and it kind of eased it on up there to the edge of the green. And then, then I made the putt. It was one of those putts that kind of lipped in. Like it wasn't, it'd been in the high side, it lipped in on the low side. And I think, you know, some things were just meant to be. And, uh, and then, I, then I birded the next, birded the next and then, then the rest, as they say, is, is history. But I still stood on the 18th tee with a five-shot lead, thinking to myself, don't Van der it. Don't Van der it. Don't Van der it. <laughs> don't, don't, just don't mess it up with this tee. Just don't mess it up. And I just plonked it down the fairway, made a par one by five, and that was that was what it happened. It was pretty cool. It, it's got to be a great feeling walking up to 18 tall with, with a five-shot lead. Yes. Um, th th were, were you able to enjoy it or, or would, I mean, there's gotta be a rush of emotions in your brains just going absolutely crazy on trying to stay in what you're doing and finish um, because it, it can go numb very quickly. I mean, we've yeah. seen that in, in tournaments, uh, especially in the last few years. So what, what, what is it or what did you do? Did you rely on a process that you, that you had practiced, uh, put in place going into that or in, in the yeah. prior? made a mistake that, that you said, I'm not going to do that again. And I, I know how to handle no, this. No, I think it, it was just all about the process. Um, and bear in mind, I've been hitting the ball so well all day that there was no reason for me to think that anything was going to go wrong. The only place that could cause me trouble was if I missed my tee shot to the right. I had a whole nother golf hole to the left. I had a whole world to the left of me. I had plenty of room. I managed to kind of plonk one down there. And then uh, as I'm walking off the tee, um, I'm telling myself, okay, just hit one more quality shot, just one more quality shot, just keep focused. But it's hard because you've got everybody, you know, shouting, shouting at you 
from the spectators. They're all mm -hmm. holding Union Jacks and the, the Cross of St. George flag and they're all shouting for me to win. And it's just, and it's hard to, to keep in that zone. So you're, you're kind of, you're kind of fighting it as you're walking up the ferry. You're, you're drifting in and out of, of being focused and not focused. But as soon as I hit that second shot and as soon as I hit the green, I allowed myself to really soak it all in as I, as I made the walk to the green because I knew once I hit the green that nobody was going to beat me. You know, I, yeah, yeah, that was, that was it. it. it it's got to be a fantastic feeling that you relax inside knowing that you achieved the ultimate in, in well sport. it it was particularly for so many reasons for me sunningdale is the course that, that we played on that for, for the aig women's open that was closest to my home <clears throat> so all of my family was there um, and bear in mind they don't get to see me see me play they hadn't got to see me play much in america mm -hmm. um my sister was there uh, a guy called keith rawlings and his right wife they, they were the, the couple that gave me the start in golf they they were the people that believed in me, that gave me the money to turn professional. Without them, I probably, I might not be here now. They were there to watch it. And uh, there were so many people there that, that, that had believed in me along the way. And uh, they, they got a chance to see their belief also come to fruition as well. And, uh, and I think mm -hmm. for as much as I was happy for me, I was more glad that I could give them something back for, for their belief in me. It, it, that that let, let's talk about that a little bit because um if from what i learned about you that that you were you went to college mm -hmm. in the u.s and, I, and we'll get into that a little bit but you you were waiting tables when, when you met yes, that couple is, that's is correct. That correct and and t t tell us how that relationship kind of developed and, and how they learned about who you were and what you did and then why they they invested in you or saw something in you that that allowed you to reach that that crowning so moment. Um, my, my, I don't come from an awful lot of money. My parents didn't have very much. My, my father was, a he worked at the port of Dover and my, my mother pressed blouses in a factory for a number of years growing up. Uh, she later went on to, to work at a school and my father drove a minibus for mentally handicapped people. So we, you know, we worked hard all our life and I had a job from the age of 13 onwards. So, um, I was trying to, uh, I, I, finished college I was playing amateur golf but I needed to work to save money to try and turn professional so I had the job at, at a golf club and of course you know if you're trying to play play professional golf you've got to practice during the day and then and then work mm -hmm. at night so I was waiting tables at night so I was waiting tables at a golf club uh, just outside side of folks in a place called Etching Hill and we would have a regular group that would come in and they, they'd been playing tennis and they'd, they'd come in and they'd have dinner at the club after playing tennis and they were quite particular um, with how they liked things. So it always came down to me that I would get their table because I didn't mind. I could talk to anybody and, you know, they, they would talk to me back about the golf and things. So anyway, one day, you know, I'd had a good summer. I played well. And uh, they, they came back to me and they said, we're really curious. We keep saying, seeing your name in the newspaper. And uh, we're wondering why you haven't turned pro yet. Why are you still here? And I said, well, you know, I'm just trying to save money. Um, this, this job, you know, I, it costs money to, to turn pro. And so I told them the whole story. So I went off, I bought the desserts out. And um, Keith, Keith Rawlings, he said to me, he said, we, we've been very lucky with our lives. Uh, we, we've been helped along the way. And uh, we really feel like you deserve a chance to, to do this. He said, we would love for you to write a budget for what you need. And we'd like to give you the help that you, that you need to get going with this. And I was floored because I'm, because I know how much this was going to cost. I'm like, Oh, I don't think mm -hmm. you know, it's this, he said, no, 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 we've been very lucky. We really want to help you out. And his wife chimed in at that point and she said, we've, we've been very serious. And so he said, come to my office tomorrow with the budget and we'll, we'll talk it through. So I was up to like two, three, four in the morning, whatever it was trying to get this down nine o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm there in his office and he, he looked through and he said, yes, he says, um, this looks good, he said. Uh, there's only one thing, he said. Um, I, I want to do this for three years because I don't want you to feel the pressure to have to get your tour card this one time. And it was just mm -hmm. like, I couldn't believe it because I knew them just from waiting tables. But I, there, but there were other people that I had known longer and better that, that might have helped but, but chose not to. And I don't hold anything against anybody. It was just one of those things. And, uh, but they stepped up out of the blue to do something good for me. There's very out, out of the kindness of their own hearts, the, 
because they felt like they they could see that I deserved an opportunity to, to do it and I was working hard to try and make my dreams happen and uh, so off I went to Q school and got my card first time around and uh, didn't look back wow that is yeah awesome. they were amazing it, it you 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 played the the ladies European tour or or you you did the the US uh, LPGA I basically uh, I got a conditional card for my first year on the LPGA tour, but I also got a ladies European tour card at the same time, but I quickly realized that I couldn't do both. Um, there wasn't enough money for me to fly back and forth and play both. So I decided to put all my eggs in the LPGA basket and, uh, and try and make sure that I was playing over here in America. And, uh, and that worked out. It, it took a while to kind of find my feet. I mean, I was down to not much money uh, in those first few months flying everywhere, trying to Monday qualify, trying to get into events. But eventually I did. And eventually I found a sponsor. I played a few pro-ams to make some extra money and uh, somehow managed to kind of keep chipping away, refusing to take no for an answer or, or to give up. I just keep just, I mean, I'm too stubborn and too hard headed. I mean, anybody, anybody who knows you, <laughs> they're like, well, she's never quitting. She's like, once she gets her teeth in there, she's going to keep going. And uh, that basically was, was me. And uh, I managed to find a way. And I, I eventually I had my first top 10 in Springfield, Illinois that, that year. And uh, I felt like I'd won the lottery. I think I won $22,000. And it was like like, I, like somebody had just dumped a million dollars on my head. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was just amazing. And then from that point on, I, I earned enough money to have a, you know, non-exempt status. I went back to Q school and got exempt anyway. But and I, I didn't really look back after that point. That, that's awesome awesome that you you played your, your way into yeah. it that you know you just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it but i mean it, it people don't understand how hard it is i mean you know that that you know i i took my shot of fame and glory it didn't work out for different reasons now it's been 20 years ago that that i i guess you could call it retired i don't know if you retire from something you're not really making much money at <laughs> yeah i'd say so <laughs> if you're working at it but it, but hilton has a small area and, and I, I still hang out and playing some of the games around here and, and y younger people will come up to me and say, you know, I'm thinking of playing what, what I said, look, you know, it, I t take your shot. You need to take your moonshot. You don't, because if you, if you go into the <laughs> office, into the, in the professional life, and, and you don't want to sit there 10, 15 years from now and look out a window on, on an 80 degree day and say, I wish exactly. I would have, I, I don't ever have those days when I look outside and it's nice and people say, why aren't you playing golf? I said, look, I did that. I've got other stuff to do that. I couldn't do then. And to your point, when you come from simple beginnings and you don't have yeah. a lot, you know, you, you, you took your shot or I took my shot and it didn't work out. And Hey, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time and effort doing that. So it, it's, it's not that I worry or nope. anything else about it, but I tell the young kids, I say, look, it's, it's you number one, you have to want it because it's mm -hmm. going to get very, very yep. difficult. You're going to be for you a lot longer. You're across the ocean, but you're going to, the kids here, you see, you're going to be a thousand miles from anybody that you yep. really know. And what, and you're playing bad. There's no support. Your fellows. I mean, golf is an interesting game where, competitors will try to beat each other's brains out while they're playing, but they will try to help each other. You know, you go to dinner, you, you hang out together, you hang, go to somebody's room, but I mean, that's only goes so far and golfers do not want to be around negative people. When somebody gets in a bit of a slump, they don't want to be no. around them. Not uh, very long. So it, 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 I try to tell them, number one, you've got to want it as bad as you want any, as bad as you want. Yeah. Air. I think Dr. Brett McCabe said, you have to want that as much as well, you want Well, and I, I think as uh, well that there is a comfort in, in your own company. Like and, and 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 being on your own is almost like your sanctuary. Like it's it's like this is mm -hmm. this is my space. I don't have to deal with anybody else. I don't have to share the ball with anybody else. This is mine. This is all for me. And there's a it's a very selfish, isolated game. And and you've got to be very comfortable with that. Uh, you don't you don't mm -hmm. want you don't you shouldn't want to share it with other people. You shouldn't want it to you shouldn't want to have to share your time with others because that's going to take you away from from where you need to be with with your golf and if you want to achieve it that's that's kind of what it takes i know there's a there's a bigger trend now for um players to to have a bunch of friends and to you know you know hang out and to do that but i still think that um that there's an element of of them being very happy with being on their own uh, yeah. And if you look at, I mean, the, obviously we just had the PJ championship a little over a week ago and 
everyone is very familiar with Brooks Koepka's mm-hmm. story as he went around European tour and, and you know, uh, mm-hmm. had to learn the, the, the only, the, they say it's the hard way, but I mean, it's really the only way if it was easy, anybody yeah. could do it. And, and I mean, that, that very much yeah. hardened him. It's obvious now that, that he has that inner fortitude and strength to, to stare down. I mean, he, he not that he stared down Tiger Woods in that one championship mm-hmm. they won at, at Bell Reeve, but I mean, he went head to head with Tiger and didn't back down and yeah. ended up winning. I mean, you got to have a lot of uh, scar tissue in a good way to, to be able to do Well, he knows like he doesn't need anybody. I mean, ultimately, mm-hmm. he, he knows that he is fully capable of doing everything for himself. Like he doesn't need anybody else to tell him or help him or to give him a push up, you know, to get him through through the tough times. He knows that he's been there and done it. And if you've been there and done it once, you can certainly do it again. Mm -hmm. Did did it help that you had gone to to college and university here in the US uh, when you came back? And and absolutely for sure. I I always say that uh, the decision to come out here to college was the best thing that I ever did. Um, Because I learned so many valuable lessons. Um, I did my freshman year at Arkansas State in, in, in Jonesboro. And I had never been to America before. I, I didn't do any of the college trips. Um, I was a really good amateur golfer. And I could have gone anywhere had I waited a year. But I was impatient. I didn't want to wait. Like I literally, I took, took the SAT on standby, hoping that somebody wouldn't show up so I could go and take the SAT in June because I wanted to go to college in August. It was like that. Like I literally had three months to find a school and go to school. That's the only, that's the time I gave myself. Mm-hmm. And um, so Arkansas State had scholarship for me. So my mum and dad just put me on a plane at Heathrow and off I went, landed in Memphis. And there I was at Arkansas State. I, I didn't have, I didn't have anything with me. I just had my golf clubs in a bag and a suitcase of clothes. And uh, I got dropped off at the dorm and there was nothing nothing on the bed I had no nothing I'm like I'm like this okay this is grim I didn't know what to expect luckily my roommate came in the next day and she took pity on me and she said oh she said um I think we need to go shopping so off we went to Walmart and got some stuff but um the lessons that I learned I mean at Arkansas State I mean Jonesboro Country Club the club that we played was so tight so tree-lined and I was in the trees all day every day like I just couldn't stop hitting it in the trees because I grew up on a Lynx golf course where there's no trees like I was free to Mm. to curve it and do do whatever I wanted to but I felt so constricted and and so limited in my in how I could to swing because of these trees so I was trying to baby the ball around the golf course trying to prod it down the fairway and I got so tired of it I'm like just I'm like, if you're going to be in these trees, at least be in the trees all the way down there. Because I was always a long driver of the golf course. Be all the way down there, and at least you have a chance. And what I learned was I actually got straighter. I, once I learned to let it go, I actually got straighter again. So that was my that was my first lesson. So I did pretty well at Arkansas State. Transferred. Uh, they were very kind to me at Arkansas State. They they released me to to transfer. Um, went to Florida State. Competition was better there for me, and that's that's really what, what why that move happened. And at Florida, was it just through talking to others as you played well, and, and you met? Yeah, and, I, and I, learning that Florida is going to be a better place for your golf game than basically. Arkansas. It was a first year program, Arkansas State, and I was winning tournaments, uh, not even playing my best. Um, I'd shoot 75, 77, and win by three. And I'm like, this is this isn't challenging me enough. And I had a friend who went to Florida State and I thought, you know, I could, you know, I really ought to think about doing something. This isn't this isn't what I expected from my for, for, for my golf. And so I needed the challenge and, and they understood that they were happy that I was there for a year, but they knew that they were kind. They're like, you know what, you do need to go and grow. And so I went to Florida State and uh, had a pretty good career there, too, at Florida State. Really had a good time academically. Not the best student in the world, but obviously quite a good golfer. Um, but things I learned at Florida State was, one, uh, trigonometry was not for me. Basketball was a much better option. <laughs> and uh, two, I learned how to hit a flop shot, more importantly, um, because I was... Out of Bermuda yes, grass. That's exactly. Impressive. Because I was always... A, my, my go-to was always a bump it, bump it into the bank and let it hop up. Can't do that in Florida. You've got You've got to... Mm-hmm. You've got to hit those lob shots. So I spent hours working on 
working on flop shots. And still to this day, it's the, it's the hardest shot for me to buy into to play because it's just not what I grew up doing. But I learned some valuable lessons um, from my time at Florida State, for sure. Met some fabulous people uh, at both schools and just becoming accustomed and acclimatized to, to living and playing golf in America. Bear in mind, these were the days where, you know, I didn't have the internet. You know, I was phoning home mm-hmm. on a collect phone call you know, there was no cell phones. Like it was wow. not, it was not the same times as, as we have now, you know? No, not at all. And uh, so it, it was very limited communication with home. So I learned to be very self-sufficient um, again in, in a, in a country that's, that I wasn't familiar with. And uh, I think it did me the world of good. Uh, I, I grew up really quickly and uh, learned how to, how to fend for myself. And and I loved everything about being in America. I loved uh, the life here. I loved everything about it. And I I remember going to one of my counselors, you know, for my classes and and she was like, okay, where are we heading? What are we doing? I said, I want to try and stay here. How do I, how can I stay? And she says, well, looking at your grades, you need to be really good at golf. (laughs) So (laughs) unfortunately I was. (laughs) What, um, so when, when you, after you graduate, there was no graduate. <laughs> no, you, you, no. you didn't uh, get your degree. At, at, I just at, got the AA. It took me, my, my hours from Arkansas state didn't transfer over. And so it was going to take me five years wow. to graduate. And I was running out of classes that I could take, um, that I was going to pass. Like it was <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, academics are, aren't for everybody and so I was one of those people I mean I have I, I have some learning difficulties so there's a you know there's an ex, I have an excuse kind of sort of although I think if I put my mind to it I probably could have done better but I was much more focused on my golf but I do have ADD and I am mm-hmm. dyslexic so I do that it was really hard for me if I wasn't in class and I wasn't paying attention in class and I was off playing golf and doing tournaments so that was really the, the issue for me. If I was in class, I'd be fine. If I was not in class, I didn't really have much of a chance at it. So uh, I struggled in, with that department, but I did three years and uh, got my AA degree. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I achieved a little bit of something by, just by doing that. And, uh, and I knew that trying to come back to, to play on the LPGA tour was something that I wanted because before I came to America, I didn't even know really that the LPGA Tour existed. I had no idea that there were so many tournaments that, that as a professional, you could play in and make money. Um, and, it was, and it was very eye-opening to me. All I had been exposed to was um, the Women's British Open as a, for, for professional golf. I really wasn't exposed to much. Well, so you, you went... You went back home at yeah. that point when you left Florida State. Was there a compelling moment that that you went all in that you wanted, or, or, or knew that you wanted to play professionally, or were you kind of in limbo where you were working, and then you met that couple that helped you out, or what was the as you left the states and went back home, where was your mindset on as far as what your what, what you my mindset to was? I I want to play professional golf as soon as I can save up enough money to do it. And the the difficulty. So, so you 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 I'm were all in. in. But once you, I was all in. I knew that that was where I wanted to go. I didn't know if I was going to make it. I didn't know if I was going to be good enough. I, I didn't know. I mean, I really didn't know. I mean, I had people say to me, "You can never make a living playing golf. Don't you think you should get a proper job?" And um, you know, I, I think my dad was was worried that I you know that I was going to be you know struggling and you know not not having a regular life and not being able to make any money and I was going to be waiting tables forever or something like that and you know as every parent does they worry mm-hmm. about what, what their kids are getting themselves into um, but I always knew that I wanted to play golf and I and I don't know why why I just kept on going like I think I just I'm just too, like I said I'm just too stubborn and too hard-headed to give up on it like this is what I've been working on all my life this is this is where I've been going. I've worked so hard already. Why would I stop? Why, why? I've just got to give it a go. If I fail, then I fail. I can always go and be a club pro or teach or do something within the golf industry. 
I knew that the golf industry was going to be there for me in some shape or form. And, um, and as it turned out, it turned out to be as a, as a player. So, and I know I'm jumping around <laughs> quite a bit. I have my, my linear timeline. It looks like an echocardiogram. <laughs> um, so let's jump ahead. So you, you did come at you, you, you got your temporary status and you got your full status yeah. back at your second run at Q school. And then what was it soon, soon after, I mean, you went on to win, I think your first win was, uh, I'm trying to long day. I'm trying to pull from what I read. You, I know you won by quite about five shots. In, in it was in Tucson. In yeah. Well. Yes, Tucson. So, so you, you're. I mean, you had to be elated um, it, that, that you you took this harder path, yeah. not by any uh, choice of your own. That, that that was just the path that was laid in front of you. And then to to reach that that first pinnacle level uh, to win on the LPGA Tour had to be amazing. It was. It was a bit of a journey to get there too, because uh, ninety nine was my first year on tour, and so two thousand I got my card back again, and then I played two thousand one. And, and 2002, I started working with a new coach because I realized that I needed to revamp my swing. Like it wasn't working the way it was. And I, you know, I had a big draw and I'm like, this thing is getting me into trouble. I'm having to fight all the time. There has to be a better way. So uh, his name was Chip Kelkey. He was at the Faldo Golf Institute here in Orlando. I started working with him and it kind of revolutionized how I, how, what I felt about my game. But about the same time, um, I got to playing golf with uh, one of the one of the pros, Wendy Doolan, and she said to me, what, "What's your plan?" And we were just playing a fun game of golf. I'm like, "Oh, we're just playing golf." She's like, "No, no, no. What's your plan?" I'm like, "Well, I don't have a plan." She says, "You are so talented. You your mental game sucks. You need a plan." And I'm like, "I <laughs> what?" Because I'd always been very physically gifted. Like I hit the ball far. I was. But I'm like. I don't get it. She's like, that's exactly why you need a plan. She says, I've got just the person for you. And she put me in touch with a lady called Martha Kobo. And uh, we started working in 2002 and through into 2003. And I started to really see some improvements in 2003. Lots of routines and how I'm practicing and, you know, little things I didn't know was even a thing. Um, even down to eating on the course, you know, drink, uh, making sure that I'm eating the right way, making sure that I'm, you know, working on when I'm peaking and, and you know, for, for the right things and making sure that I'm getting rest and, and really appreciating the fact that rest is part of performance as opposed to thinking that mm -hmm. rest is a bad thing because, you know, I should be working every single hour of the day. So all the things started to fall into place and I started to really come into some really good form towards the end of 2003. So roll that into 2004 and I go off to Australia to play a couple of European tour events because by this point I kind of got my mindset that I might want to play on the Solheim Cup team. So in order to do so I have to become a member of the European tour again and to do that I have to win a tournament. So I thought okay I've got to try and get my act together with this. So couple of European tour events. The first one I play in was on the Gold Coast and it was the Australian Masters. And I played really well. And I'm in the final group on the final day with Annika Sorenstam. And I, I don't remember what our scores were. I have a feeling we were kind of tied. I might have even had a one-shot lead. But I, I want to say that we were, I was neck and neck with Annika Sorenstam. And we go off in the last mm -hmm. group. Well, she goes off to a fly of a start, something like eagle birdie start. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm way back. So I push. I try and catch up to her. And, of course, I drop a few shots because I'm pushing. I'm trying to make it happen. And as we go round the round, she kind of slows back again. Of course, I'm too far back now. I make a few birdies, and we end up being fairly close. She wins, but I'm fairly close, and I'm still playing well. And it was like the aha moment for me. There was a light bulb that went off in my head. It's like... Why were you trying to push? Why were you trying to make it happen? If, you, if, I, if I had just played my own game and wait to see how, how the chips fell at the end of the round, you could have won this. And it was that moment that kind of really put into play what happened in Tucson. So I came back from Australia, went to Tucson. I ended up winning by five in Tucson. And it was, it was like, a, you don't know that you have it in you till you do it. And then when you do, you're like, I've got it. I've done it. This and it was just I mean I was crying before the before I couldn't even see the I couldn't even see the ball because I I knew I'd won and I couldn't see the ball because the tears were like under my glasses just streaming because I was just just the relief and 
joy of all the work and effort just had come out and it was just, and it had happened. The, the, what, what would be, and this might seem, this is only an odd question maybe to somebody out there listening and, until uh, maybe I get it out, but the differences between winning that event and then winning a major championship, I know the circumstances were completely different, but not, not you're, you're in a, in a select class that there's not a whole lot of people on the planet when you consider the population uh, that have won a professional golf tournament and a professional major uh, and being that, that you had put so much work and time and effort into that and things were starting to work your way. And then fast forward, you know, to, to winning mm -hmm. the major, were there, were there great differences in the two or was it just, it was, there was just completely different circumstances that, that, that they were both just great moments uh, of your career. I, I think there was a lot of similarities. Um, I had played well in Australia leading into Tucson. And I had also played well at mm -hmm. Evian the week before leading into the Women's Open. Um, and I remember being very disappointed at both uh, Australia and Evian that I hadn't managed to win those. But I was able to turn it around and, and win the following week. Um, so in, in that respect, they, they, were, they were similar. I would say that the quality of my golf was was incredibly good at both at both times. I had that same hitting the ball at the sweet spot. Couldn't wait to get to hit it. Like the feeling that I cannot miss the center of the club face. There was a freedom in my swing that that is that was just so pure to feel. Like that it was just flowing. Like there was nothing that was going to hold my follow through back. It was just the most free and just amazing feeling and uh and, and that's really what you, i couldn't wait to get to feel there's the and, and watching the ball fly exactly as i pictured it and do exactly whether it's the little fall to the right or the little fall to the left like do exactly as i had seen it in my head um and i just couldn't wait to do it so the, the mentality was exactly the same uh, at both times um it was pretty close as well in in uh in phoenix i had an eagle uh, sorry in tucson i had an eagle late in the final round to kind of start pulling ahead uh and this in the same way as i finished birdie 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 par at sunningdale to win the, the women's open by five so i so I, it got to a point where almost i could see the barn the finish line's coming and instead of choking i i, I actually put my foot on the gas and accelerated towards the finish line. I had a final spurt that kind of just took me away from everybody else. So in many respects, it, they were both, they were quite similar, but in how they felt during it, they didn't feel any different to me during it. There was no different it, because I was totally removed from the result. I was all about the one shot and hit and getting that feel. I was totally removed from it. And then you win your first one and you like realize I've done this. I've finally won. And then when I went and won the, the major, I think the joy was not about winning the major for me. It was literally more for everybody else. Like winning the first, the first LPGA event, that was, that was proof to me. That was me. That was for me. That was, I've done this. I've done it. But then the major, the second win, that was for everybody else. That was for the people that had helped me along the way. That was for, that was for, I don't know. It was a thank you for everything. And, um, you know, obviously I was kind of happy that I had a nice check and a major trophy and, and made a major title that nobody can ever take away from me. That's kind of always sweet too. Um, yeah, very but much. But then, no, so, so that it was the same and different at the same time. Was there anything that surprised you after you became a tour winner and or a major winner? Yes, it surprised me how poorly I handled the media attention. Um, I've always been very chatty. I like talking to the media, uh, but I was so overwhelmed after I won the, the Women's British Open. I, I overwhelmed, like I couldn't, the phone didn't stop ringing. Like I, I didn't know, I, I, I just wanted a little bit of quiet I just, and, I, and I wasn't getting it. It was so overwhelming. Everybody wanted to talk. Everybody was wanting interviews. Everybody was wanting stuff. And I wish I had handled that and enjoyed it a little bit more than I did at the time. Um, 
because I, 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 I regret not taking advantage of every single opportunity that came my way when it happened. Because you think it's going to happen again, right? You think, oh, this is, happen- this is going to happen every week now. And, of course, it doesn't. Um, but it's, um, but I, had no, I, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a management company at the time. I was doing everything on my own. And so it hit me really hard and fast. And, um, but, but luckily, I had a tournament the next week in Toledo. So I was able to hop on a plane and just hide on the golf course again. And I came second that week. So I was able to play well. But I think it surprised me how poorly um, I handled how, how I handled it. Um, I, I wish I had done a better job uh, of that. But ultimately, I, I still did it. <laughs> When you when you win a tournament like that, that that is one of the biggest on the, in in the game, um, is is there is there a letdown afterwards, and that, that there's an emotional toll, and it doesn't seem like anything gets you up as much as as you as high as you were on, or is it that the that you when you got put on a path that said you you need some structure, you're extremely talented, uh, you're you're you have the ADHD, so you're, but and you're very abstract, yep. but we're going to provide you some yep. structure to, to allow you to do this. So w- was it the adherence that, that you had worked so much on that to, to get to that point that it was just, you fell right yep. back in into place on going through your routines yep. and everything, or was there any letdown that, Oh, geez, uh, I, I just want to British open. I'm here in Toledo, Ohio, mm-hmm. and this is not as big. So no, not gonna no, there was that. none of that. Like it was all, let's just keep going. Let's, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. This is all about, because the the addiction is hitting the shots for me like I said the, the when I played well it was not it was never about the results as it turned out it was never really truly about winning it was about what I got out of the feel of of, of the of the game of golf and and I think the only letdown happens it was just an, from an exhaustion perspective you know you when you when you've played well for three or four weeks in a row and you've been in contention for three or four weeks in a row, mentally you're, you're exhausted because you're, because you're doing exactly what you should do. Your, your process, every single shot. Like I would say, I mean, obviously you don't hit quality shots, you know, much, you know, very often. Um, but you know, in those times, if you can say that mentally you were, you, you stuck to your process 90% of the time, you're going to have a good week. If you're, and if, you know, and the weeks, those weeks, I would say my process was, I was in my process as much as 99% of the time. Like I was all laser like focus. I was in. And, um, and, and that kind of takes its toll on you mentally. So there was a, there was definitely an element of tiredness when that happened. So then you take a week off and then it's hard to build it back up again from that point on because it's like, Mm -hmm. how do you, how do you get back up to that same, to that same level again. Yeah, I, I try to equate it to some people who ask me, uh, and again, I, I'm not saying I got anywhere you're near your level. I didn't. I didn't even get my tour card. But I, I used to equate it to say, you know, you, you're. It, it's like going to the gym because a lot of people go to the gym. I say, you, you know, if you do chest one day, you're not going to do chest again a day or two later. You're going to you need a couple of days of rest for the muscle to rebuild yeah. everything else. So t- taking a, a week or two weeks off and, and then coming back into it. It's like, if you took a month off at the gym, you're not gonna be able to lift the same no. weight for a lot of different reasons. It's just not going to be there, but within a week or so you, you you'll have it yeah. back. Um, <clears throat> it kind of falls into place, especially when you have a background and you've done it for some period of time. So g- going forward, a- a- as you mentioned, you, you expect to win yeah. on a more regular basis or almost every time you tee it up. And then you, you, if I, you, you played roughly another seven years after that? Pretty much, yeah. Well, I had my son uh, in 2007. So that was three years after, mm-hmm. three years after. And of course, everything changes. Uh, nothing's ever the same again. And so you, you, you learn to play golf a different way. Um, I mean, not, not just physically, but, but mentally. I mean, you're not getting any sleep, you know. So you can't be as mentally mm-hmm. sharp or as mentally switched on. But I had moments of, of being pretty good I I won a tournament in 2009 on the ladies European tour so you know I had moments of still being good but I just couldn't do it to the same degree and then it it got to the point where he started school and and I I wasn't seeing him on the road anymore because I was still traveling and he was going to school and then also 
when I was home, I wasn't seeing him because I was still grinding on the, go- on, the, on the golf course working. And I'm like, this is really miserable. And, uh, and I just kind of lost the love of the game for all manner of reasons. One, it got really hard. Um, and, I, and, I, and I was struggling to justify the amount of time that I was spending away from him uh, when I was at home. It's that, it's that ultimate mum guilt, isn't it? Like where you're, you're, you're guilty um, when you're sp- with him because you're not working on your golf. And then you're guilty when you're working on your golf because you're not with your son. It's, it's, uh, it, it became very difficult for me. And I was fortunate enough to go down a different path. That there, that is. I want to get into that, and that's another good segue to to the, another portion of this. Is I wanted to ask you about. So obviously, there's the challenges of playing professional sports and golf, in particular, with the travel and everything else involved. is very difficult on a family, uh, but even more so for for the ladies on the ladies tour because the the, the child rearing years, the, the, there is some there is a limit yep. on that time, and it, it, it's got to be. For for those who have the kids, there you, you're pulled in multiple directions. With your 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 mom motherly instinct, yeah. and then what you want to do, and you want to be there. Um, and then the, the other girls who who don't have kids early on, then you know they they know that that clock is ticking. And so I wanted to ask you for on on both aspects. You you addressed how how you handled it, and as you're as you you do work with the golf channel yeah. and you you cover the ladies tour, how do most of the other girls uh, deal with that? That that as you talk to them. Well, there's a, there's an interesting um, thing now. I mean, obviously the, the, the tour is getting very young. So, so you've got a lot of players coming out without even going to college. You get, get the, the super talented players that will come in. Um, your Lorena Ochoa's, your Annika Sorenstam's even, uh, your Lydia Ko that potentially will do this too, that will leave and then have babies. They'll, they'll, they'll have their career and then they'll retire young enough uh, to 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 have have their family afterwards. Um, people like Julie Inkster, myself, Katrina Matthew, we played through having babies and then continued to to keep to try and play a little bit a little bit deeper into the careers. It's very difficult to do, um, but the talent uh, that is on the LPGA tour is is young, it's deep, it's hungry, and it's very difficult to to keep up with that pace uh, as a mother. Um, because it's just, I'm not saying that it's impossible. I mean, you can do it. Stacey Lewis is, is doing a great job right now, but it's very difficult. Brittany Lincecum, that they're trying, but it's so hard. You've got to, you have limits on daycare hours and times and you've got to pick them up and drop them off. You might not be getting sleep. They could be sick. You know, you are a mother first and foremost, and then you play golf. Mm-hmm. It's completely the opposite to what you've been doing all your life. It's all about you. Everything's you. Me, 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 me. How am I going to play golf? How am I going to get better? How am I going to eat? How am I going to work out? Now it's not that. It's like, okay, what do they need? What do they need? Can I squeeze in five minutes for me? No, I can't. Okay. Can I, can I, you know, can you look after Logan for two minutes whilst I go and do this? You know, it's, it becomes them first. And so your, your whole mindset has to shift. Uh, you go from being incredibly selfish about yourself and your time to not being able to be anything of the sort. You have to be selfless and and devote everything you have to your child because that's what you that's what you that's what they deserve. And um, mm-hmm. and rationalizing it all out in your head when you've been one way for all this time is is very difficult. Um, and it's and I think that the hardest part of it is is watching your golf game change. Because you remember how good you were and, and when you had all that time, when you were fully rested you were, and, and when you were as flexible, when you didn't have aches and pains, when, when everything was firing on all cylinders, you remember how that felt and what that was like. To know, and all of a sudden, it'd be completely different and everything has changed. Like your swing is like, oh, that hurts or, or it's like, oh, I'm tired. I don't have the energy. Or it's like, oh, I had a terrible night's sleep and I've got a cold because Logan's given me his cold that he's picked up in daycare. Or, and it's just, mm-hmm. and I'm like, and you're just not the same. Like, I, I never hit the ball the same again. Like, I, I lost distance. Like, I was, was not quite as long as I was. And that uh, it takes its toll mentally on you because it's hard to let go of what you were and where you are now. And I think I needed to readjust my 
priorities within my own head. And I really needed to set new goals for myself. Um, but I didn't know how to do that. Like I didn't know how to, to stop being the Karen Stuffles that I was before Logan to becoming a, a new version of myself and being completely content and happy with what I have as being the mother. Um, because I, part of me couldn't let go of what I was as a major champion. And uh, again, I could have done a much better job of that. So I have, a, I have, I mean, I know exactly what all these the players are going through that are having children and, and trying to work through that. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a completely different thing for, for women when they have, have, when they have the babies and that, and they try and play golf as opposed to, you know, a guy having a baby. It makes me laugh. It's like, oh, say, you know, Jason Day's just had a baby. Oh yeah. He, no, he's not getting any sleep. I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> it's not, the, not quite the same, but yeah. No, and, and I know my, my own playing and how much, uh, how selfish I had to be at my own time. And I, I remember, and it never dawned on me when, when I would sit there and I'd, you know, watch some of the, the, the women's open or the, the women's British. And, and it finally dawned on me one time, I said, God, I'm a self-centered SOB and I don't have kids. And I couldn't even imagine having kids and, and, and having to be the mother of the kid and, and having to take care of and all those responsibilities and duties. I'm like, wow, that, 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 that was kind of eye-opening to me where I had a whole new found respect for women that played the LPGA yeah. tour in, in, in yeah. general. Um, as far as some of the ladies out there who were, uh, do, do you, do you talk to, like, are you a mentor to some of them about what you experienced and how to help them? And then how, with what we just talked about, and then how, how would you go about helping or advising somebody who's comes to you and says, look, I'm playing really well, or I, I, I know I'm on a, I, I know I'm building to, towards something better, but I do have this thing in the back of my head, this nagging, uh, thing where I, I want to have a family and I want to have kids. And, and I'm trying to balance my playing career. And, and when I give that up, but I can't seem to do it now because I'm, I'm trending in the direction I want to after all these years of putting in this. Do you know, it, it's, it's hard to ask people for help and it's hard to ask people um, for anything like that. Obviously I'm in the media now. So I think there's obviously a little suspicion there when it comes to um, asking stuff, questions like that, but I'm very open. Um, Obviously, it wouldn't go any any further. I'm very open to share any any of my experiences or anything that I've been through. If anybody wants any help or anything along the way, I'm quite happy and in order to do so. But I think everybody has to kind of find their own way and make their own path because everybody's experiences are so different and their mentalities are different. And without mm -hmm. knowing their mentality and what's been going on in their head, it's very hard. I can I can relate from my perspective. But my perspective may be different, um, but I do know that they're going to have to overcome the same kind of obstacles and challenges. Um, obviously, I'd love to help people because there, I think there's a there's an area there that, that could be addressed for some of these players because you can see they're struggling um, and, and wrestling with those decisions because it isn't easy. Um, I, I think that the decision for me came down to to this, and I think you have to be accepting of the fact that you may never play the same golf again. You have to accept the fact that you may not be everything that you once were and that you're fully prepared to be able to walk away from golf and do something completely different. And I think, I think it comes to that point. Like you, you ha you can't just let go of everything that you've done in your life your dreams and your goals and your aspirations, but you also can't hold to the, onto those forever because maybe winning golf tournaments isn't in, in the cards for you. You just don't know that. You, and you just have to get to a point where you're like, okay, I accept whatever I've got. This is what I have. Having a family then becomes more, much more important than anything else that you can do on the golf course. And then, and then having a child, like I always think now that Logan's the best thing that I've ever done with my life doesn't matter what I did on the golf course. He's the best thing that I've ever done. And so I'm completely content with all of my choices and decisions regarding when I had him. And I think, I think people get to that point in their lives. Does the LPGA, in your opinion, do, do enough to, to help 
some of the girls and the ladies out there that, that do have kids as far as daycare. But, and I only say that because I remember when the PGA tour and I got, I can't even remember how long ago this was 15, 20 years ago when they were, uh, the players and everyone was kind of bragging that they now have this daycare so that the wives can go out and watch the, the guys play. But I, and, and I don't, I'll self admit it. I don't follow the LPJ as much, obviously, as I follow the, either the PJ tour, or the live tour. Um, but I, I don't hear a lot about all the, the, the things that the tour does to, to alleviate some of the burden or so that the moms can go out there and play at least for get on the course for five yep. hours and really put all 110% of their attention into their, their career, uh, for that period of time to where they, they don't have to, they, they know that their child is, is somewhere safe and is going to be taken yep. care of, even if it's not a family member, if it's so, someone that's helping them. So that has the tour done enough yeah. in your opinion? To, to help the, t- the tour actually have a, a really fabulous daycare. Um, Smuckers sponsor it, so that's kind of nice that it's sponsored by. It has a sponsor, and they've been <laughs> sponsoring cool. them for as long as I can remember. Um, they are. They have a very consistent group of ladies that that help. Bardeen and Joy. Bardeen and Joy are still there now, and they were there when Logan was in school. He's sixteen now, so they've they've seen him. They've and and I always say this that Logan has turned out to be a kind, wonderful, intelligent kid because he was in the LPGA daycare. He's well-rounded. He likes to travel. He's a better kid because he was involved with Bardeen and Joy with the LPGA daycare. Um, I'm 100% certain he doesn't get all of that from me. So he had to get it from somebody that has a nicer (laughs) heart and that that would be Bardeen and Joy. But they, they travel with with the same, you know, the same equipment and toys, have a big van. They, they, they set up every week in the same place. It adds consistency uh, to the children. Um, and us as parents, we trust them 100% with our kids. I mean, as I said, I, I owe them a great deal of gratitude to, to allow me to continue to play tournaments and, and, and for the great job that they did raising Logan. <laughs> Yeah, and I can imagine that, you know, remembering, God, four and a half decades ago when I was five years old, I, I really didn't care where my mom, I mean, my I, my grandmother lived two miles away, so she would often watch mm-hmm. me, but if my mom had to take me somewhere, I, I didn't really care where I was going so long as I had, I knew that what toys and everything I was going to get to yeah. play with. If I was in that, my own little world, I mean, I, so I don't think, I mean, as parents, and I'm not a parent, I have a niece that's four years old, but I have, obviously I have a lot of friends, and I, I can understand the anguish that oh my God, you know, it's, it's not the ideal scenario because you're in that protective mode yeah. and you're always what you should be thinking of your child nonstop, 24, seven, 365. Yeah. And it's gotta be nerve wracking to, to put them in an environment. But as I look at it from an outsider, it's like, well, circumstances will help develop your yeah. child. And if it was a, a different situation, maybe you didn't understand that life is not going to be the way that you want it as much as you try to make it for your kids. But their their life will mold and f- uh, them as as young kids and, mm-hmm. and teenagers and as they grow in, in, into adults. So, you know, there might be something that comes out of that for for kids. And I'm as you mentioned, your son is well diversified, yep. well traveled, well everything yep. because he was exposed to exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. And it's and it's like there were there were things that that he still remembers, like it, like his favorite meals that they would make at lunch. Like he still has there's still some of his favorite meals now to this day. Like he'd love to eat. They, they used to do a meatloaf with mac and cheese. Like he still likes meatloaf and mac and cheese. <laughs> and, uh, and he still likes to play cards. Like they would play spoons and Uno and stuff. And he still likes to play cards. I mean, I'm sure they've turned him into a card shark, which, you know, could stand him well in his college days. But, um, but no, he's, he's, he's and, and traveling. Like he loves to travel, like loves to jump on an airplane and pack and go places. Like, because he's grown up doing it. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. as I said, he's it's part of his exactly. DNA. Yeah. So I'm very grateful to them. You know, one, one thing I want to ask you about that, that as I was learning about your, your career and what you've done and, and you, you were, you were very open with a, a challenge that you had and, and that, that I want to get across it to a lot of either young girls who are struggling with this uh, in their identity or uh, ladies out there in general. And, and that, that was after you had your son, Logan, you, you, you had a little bit or you struggled with uh, mm-hmm. your weight and, and then you, you made the determination to, to do something about it. So can, can you elaborate on sure. that? Just to t- talk about that. So um, obviously you put on quite a bit of weight when you, when you have a baby and 
he was, and after I had him, he was the hungriest, the, the, I don't want to sleep ever baby. Like he, he probably didn't get more than, more than, I mean, he, he might've lasted two hours when he was five months old, but it was, I mean, the lack of sleep was, was extreme. And so for me, it was like, I've just got to eat. I just need to eat for any energy, anything. Just give me a donut. Just give me something. I just needed, I just needed something to make me feel okay. You know, I just needed energy to get through the day to play golf. And I came back and played tournament really quickly. I pl- played a tournament ten weeks after having him, and I came second. Um, but it was just, it was just so draining on me physically, and I and I really struggled to lose the weight. And I would go to the gym and I would train, I'd lift weights and I'd get strong again, but the weight was just hanging on me. And what I realized was I was really miserable uh, being heavy. Um, I wasn't swinging as well as I could. I really hated how I looked. And I'm like, this is making me really miserable. And there was a little bit of depression in there too, just because of the weight wasn't going. And I'm just, just really unhappy. Um, with myself just hated how I looked and and uh, so no clothes weren't fitting I couldn't get into you know it was just a miserable miserable place to play golf in so I decided that enough was enough and I I decided that I had to lose weight so I literally I cut out red rice pasta potato and dairy cold turkey just one day I just that's it I'm just stopping it and I just told myself I'm just gonna say no to if if any time the thoughts enter my head that I I'm I want this or that I need this I'm just going to tell myself no you don't you don't need it you you you're worth more than that you're on this journey to lose weight and it actually fell off me quite you know it started to lo- I started to lose weight and I got into the best shape of my life because I just stuck to it and I and I was able to tell myself no and and it's not that easy for people and I still have weight issues now I mean I have had a I mean I've just had my thyroid removed I've had a whole bunch of thyroid issues and who knows if that wasn't an issue for me back then too um you know there are all kinds of you know medical things that happen that that can cause these problems but I am very much aware that it's just not as easy as saying no sometimes because people eat for all manner of reasons for me I just needed it to feel good because I wasn't feeling good about anything else I was tired I was exhausted I needed some energy. I just needed something good and food was the good thing for me. And then I realized that it was actually not food was making me miserable because it was making me hate how I looked and how I felt. And so once I had that kind of realization, I kind of took control over what I was eating and I, and I still fight. I still fight that to this day. Um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to be better with my discipline and, and, and how I think about food and, and what I, what I put in my system, um, with the, with my health issues that I've just had recently, uh, with, with my thyroid, you know, I have to think again, what am I eating? How is this going to benefit me? Is this something that that's worth, is this, is it worth it to me for how this makes me feel afterwards, um, versus the, the health benefits of not eating it. So, it's it's a constant battle that 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 will that 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 will cur- curb you fast. Ma- making the mistakes of feeling like shit yeah. after you eat something that you know you shouldn't have it will, will, will curb your more than anything that anyone can yeah. tell you. And I, I speak from experience because I did, I, when I was younger, I mean, I was very rail thin, so I could eat whatever I wanted, and I never gained yeah. weight. And I said, "No, nothing. I'm going to be fine." And then I. I you know, I said it on, on the show, I, it was hard for me to come out with this uh, for a long time, but I, I had uh, cancer a couple of years ago. I had surgery and there is nothing more motivating than changing your diet yeah. than having that, that scare. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was, a, I'm a, I'm admitted junk food holic. <laughs> I mean, I used to be, my brother and I would sit there and eat a half a bag of Oreos each watching a, 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 the masters or the U S yeah. open. And I mean, it, it, it's been a long four years for me to, to curb yeah. that. And th- there are times when I can walk through the bakery at Costco and walk through there and say, yeah, you, you, it just bounces right off. And there's other times where I can't walk through and I'm just salivating yeah. and, and, and understand, understand that yep. struggle. It's, it's, it's not, it's not easy. And, it, and because, you know, it's like, why can't I just have something nice? I just want something nice. Mm. And, but the reward is you, you pat yourself on the back and you say, you know what? 
you are doing something nice for yourself by not having it. It's a, uh, it's, it's you've got you've got to turn turn something that that's so hard into into a positive. Have you gotten to the point that that you have have done this long enough that 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 you that you can? It, it's it, as I look at I look at back I'm either as time in the gym or in your golf game where, where you you struggle. Let's say like, like you you had the struggle with with uh, the flop shot and then you eventually developed it. It will always be not your default because yeah. that's not what you grew up with. It's not at the base of your DNA, but you developed it. But after a number of times, you're like, yeah, I, I, I can do this. And then, but you, and you, the more you do it, the more you, you, you develop that strength to say, I don't need this. So I, I think after four years of doing this, I've gotten to a point where I've, I've crested the, the mountain, yeah. so to speak, in that I, I, I can, I can avoid doing those things the majority of the yeah. time. I think I'm at least 60 plus percent of the time that I can say, I, I don't need a piece of cake or I'm not yeah. going to have those cookies. <laughs> Cause that is my vice. I mean, my mother was a great or is a great baker yeah. and cook and growing up in that household, maybe I didn't have a chance, <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I can speak to that struggle. Yep. Your uh, sugar, sugar's a toughie. Yeah. I'm the same way with sugar. Like I, mm -hmm. it, it's the hardest thing for me to say no to. And, uh, and you put into the fact that you have a teenage kid who can eat anything and do anything. And that's all he, ha that's all he wants to do is eat sugar and stuff. It's like, it's always in the house. So saying no to it, it's always hard, but it's, you know, how much yeah, for, it, better you are been, than not. Yeah. It's been kind of steps for me. I'm, I'm sitting here drinking uh, now that these things are so famous, these zero sugar sodas. Yep. I mean, for me, it's like being a teenager again, that I can have those. And now I have a sip of the regular stuff and I almost it's too sweet. I mean, it's so yep. sweet. Yes. So I, I, when, when that happens, I, I know I've made a, a fair amount of progress. Yeah, so absolutely. Keep going with it. You're, you're right. It, it, it is a daily yeah. grind to do. And you, you hit streaks where like your game, you know, you're just hitting it as good as you want to. It's like, t tell me, do you want me to hit it 142 or 143? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't need any of that stuff. I'm fine. Don't yeah. worry about it. And then there's just days like, I, there's no way I, I need a. I need well, and there's a, there's a point we think, oh, it'll just be fine. Just a little bit won't be, it'll be fine. Just a little bit. And then, and then the next day you're like, oh, it's okay. I'll just have another little bit. And then the, and then the next day it's like, oh, I'll just have one more little bit. Next thing you know, it's been a week of little bits and you're, and you've all, and you've mm -hmm. off the wagon. You're like, so. And, but I, I think that the fact you catch yourself means that you've been through enough mm -hmm. and you think I'm not going to give up on all the hard work that I put in prior to this, just for this thing that is kicking <laughs> my ass for the last seven yep, days. Exactly. It, can, can I ask you a little bit about the women's game? Because sure. whenever the golf world sees it, um, there, there's, and, and there's been some very big strides in the last number of years on uh, more uh, get, getting girls younger girls to play golf and the initiative for that do you, do you think enough is being done or as somebody who's been in and around the game who came from meager beginnings and worked her way up and, and now you're you're i mean you obviously played at a professional level but now you see it from a bigger scope being in the golf media and at the golf channel mm -hmm. and, and you you see and you're aware of a lot of things and, and what's being done do, do you think that there could be more done or do you think that the path that it's on is the correct path? i think that i mean obviously we're making strides lpj have the lpj girls golf and that's you know that's obviously improving uh the numbers i, I would i mean i i think about my own way into golf and I, I got into golf because my dad played golf but in the uk it was very inexpensive like he was an artist and member of the golf course so that meant that he would do work on the course he'd go fill divots do stuff that he could play at a, at a reduced rate and so it was it was and because i was young i got to play for free and i would go and have a lesson with the pro for a pound they give one pound and for a, for that pound i got a, a can of soda and a, and a candy bar and a lesson you know it was like it was a win-win I, I mean i know it was like a thousand years ago but you know the, 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 it's the thought of, of say for five dollars you could get a, a can of you could get a soda and a candy bar and a lesson and that's probably the, the equivalent today mm -hmm. but that that kind of it, it made for an affordable saturday you know so it also you know it gave me a place to go and i could go practice afterwards and i was able just to be at the golf course and I think that that golf is is just an expensive sport, and from what I can see, it's just really hard for 
for kids to get into it because it it requires money you know you've got to buy a club you've got to have access to a golf course you've got to even buy the practice balls you've got to pay for lessons like it just is escalates into a lot whereas you can just pick up a ball and shoot some hoops or you can just pick up a you know you go play mm-hmm. softball or get a ball and kick it around there are other sports you could play that that don't require the same amount of uh expenditure straight away to get into plus the fact golf is incredibly difficult you know it's not i mean you can you can kick a, a soccer ball and you're going to see instant results you, you, so you could swing a golf club and, and miss it the first hundred times you swing it you know it's, it's not gonna it's not doesn't necessarily gonna equal success first time out so i i would love to see there be more uh golf in schools I would I would love to see see golf taught as a class in schools um, because it would introduce more people to it and give other kids an avenue to a sport that isn't necessarily a team sport that that they can do individually on their own regardless. I'd like to see high schools or or middle schools have relation, better relationships with with golf courses to whereby. Uh, the me- members of the course or the public facility will allow them, you know, between certain hours to go and hit balls for free on the range. I think there are things that you can do to to grow the game in, in, in that that regard. I mean, I, one of my favourite stories about growing the game of golf is was is comes from the LPGA and about I mean I, c- I can't this is just off the top of my head, but about twelve years ago the LPGA had a, started a tournament in Thailand. And about 12 years, it's probably more than that now, maybe it's 14 years ago. Excuse me for not being on top shape for this, but back then there was probably four players from Thailand that had a world ranking. And and, and, and they were okay, but they weren't like world beaters. But the LPGA hosted a tournament in Thailand and the LPGA players would have a junior clinic and you'd have a bunch of these little juniors would, would show up and you know, they'd be give Christy Kerr would do it and you know, Paula Creamer would, would, would go along and they'd, they'd do these clinics. Well, fast forward to, you know, here we are twelve, thirteen, fourteen years later, and you've got something like fifty Thai players with a world ranking. I mean, it has exponentially grown the women's game. You've had Thai players you've had two Thai players be number one in the world, Eri Jutanagan and Latai Tidkun. Mm-hmm. And one of those Thai players, Eri Jutanakan, actually says that that she inspired her was going to that junior clinic by Christy Kerr. So there are all manner of ways that you can grow the game. And and that was one of my, my favorite growing the game stories because it does actually happen. That by giving your time and doing something like a junior clinic can actually inspire a whole country to do better yeah that, that's that's amazing that, that's very very cool um one thing that's been talked about a lot the last couple of years and something this is you you are at forefront on on this because you you cover the lpga tour has been the disparity in the amount of purses that the women play for mm-hmm. versus the men and i mean it, it is from what i see and, and i'm just seeing it from a, one perspective is it's like well if the sponsorship dollars are there, if, if companies are willing to step up, which a, a few of them have in the last year or so, year, two, two years, that they really, and, and the purses have grown. But it's, it's like the companies first have to step up. I, I, I don't see it as an equality issue as much as I see it as a capitalist, uh, maybe for lack of a better term, issue that the, the mm-hmm. whatever corporations for whatever reason, aren't thinking that they're going to get their money back. But the, there's the, the women's tour is growing, is becoming popular and more attended from what yep. i can see if if you were if the if the tour came to you and said we'll make you the, the mm-hmm. queen of decision making for, for this yep. year what would you do to to increase the purses and, and to have the, the ladies play for more money well that's a, that's a long road to, to walk with with that regards um i i kind of feel like we and this is this is hard to say because it shouldn't be that way. But I almost feel like we're we're kind of a generation away from that because you know right now the generation that we're in is you know we're not used to seeing women um, in positions of 
running companies and, and, and doing, you know, working hard. A lot of the time we're still used to seeing our mothers stay home and raise kids and raise the family. Mm-hmm. We're still kind of in that cycle. But I know that my son, he's grown up watching me bust ass. He's grown up watching me go out, make, make money, provide for the family and work really hard. So he knows and his generation knows that, the, that their mothers have worked incredib- incredibly hard to get where they are and deserve more. So I think that you'll start to see that turning around as the younger generation moves into, into those kind of positions. Um, but what we can do right now, um, for my money, I mean, obviously, it's about respect. Like, I, I feel like you've got to grow respect. You've got to grow a fan base. You've got to try and grow uh, the popularity. You've got to give people a reason to watch women's golf. You've got to provide a place for them to watch women's golf. My my platform has always been, I would love to see more feature group coverage and things like that because you can then see a group go from the first hole to the 18th hole from eight o'clock in the morning and you'll be able to see them, you know, see women's golf, whether it be streaming or wherever from eight o'clock in the morning through till six thirty at night, you're going to be able to find it somewhere mm-hmm. and you're going to be open to, to just logging in and, and, and watching it. And I think that in this day where everything is, there's so much streaming going on that that shouldn't stop the LPGA tour from, from moving forward. And there has to be a, a market for that because the more you can watch and, and the more it's seen, the better off you are. And, and, I, and I've always felt like feature groups was, was going to be a big thing. And I also think proper statistics as well, because then you can really quantify just how good the women are. You can really put it down on paper exactly what they do. Okay, we have the KPMG Performance Insights. But it's not the same as shot link. It's not the same as knowing exactly, mm-hmm. like say from 50 yards in B parks, average proximity of the hole is 15 feet. We don't have that. We, we don't, not really. And, uh, and so there's all kinds of hurdles as to why we can't have it, but we digest in the media and uh, fans digest golf from watching PGA Tour golf standards we have shot link we have strokes gained we, we're able to see ball plots where they've gone and, and how they've happened and who scored what from where and how difficult the up and down percentages from certain spots around the green we're used to seeing that kind of data and when you don't see that in women's golf it does two things one it it, it kind of belittles the product because you think oh well you know yeah. they're not investing in it and there's nothing for me to see here. Therefore, why am I watching it? And from another perspective, it, the media don't have anything to write about or to talk about because they can't put it because they don't know how to put it into perspective because they're not regulars like me. They don't follow the women's golf like I do. They don't see it with their own eyes. They're, they're having to pick up on cues from what they see on TV. And, and that doesn't give you the full picture of what's going on. Like you, you, you think Brooke Henderson might be driving it great, but in actual fact, the statistics are that she might not be doing that. I mean, that's just a random example, but because that's not the case because she's a great driver of the ball. But unless you have it in black and white, facts and figures, numbers in front of you, how to compare and how to talk about it, how are you going to, how, how are you going to write an article or a story without having facts and figures to, to use? Because then it becomes a, a touchy feely piece and, and, and women don't need touchy feely because people think that's what we are anyway. You, you need cold, hard facts and figures. You, we, we need to be respected and taken seriously because of how we play golf or because of how they play golf. And I think you do that in using those two things. You know, and, and I asked that, uh, I have a number of friends who asked me, what, why do you think the women's game does not get, or is not growing especially in today's world with social media and everything else, it's not growing is or is not catching up to the men's game as quickly as, as it seems it should. And I, I didn't have an answer. The only answer I had, uh, and it, it may sound somewhat chauvinistic, but I was, a, when I was playing, I was playing and played no one and no two and no five and no six. And back then Colin Cowherd was a on ES, uh, was he on he was an ESPN yep. radio, I believe. And one reason he, he, he said that people watch 
like to watch the stars yep. and uh or or, or in in this instance the men's sports because the men sports can do things that your average yep. joe can't and i'm only bringing this up not to be chauvinistic but to, to illustrate your point from the perspective that i had it's that the perspective of most men is that they, they can they can't, but they can think that they can play the game that, that some of the ladies play it and that they can hit it as far as they can and they're as good. But to your point, if they had the same, if they could see the statistics yeah. in it, hey, uh, Brooke Henderson's average distance for, with a pitching wedge is 17.6 yeah. on you know, average. And, and, you know, then these people go out there and they go their course and they, well, geez, I missed the green four times with a wedge and I hit it twice and I was 30 yeah. feet. The, 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 not only to the, to the reporters and the media, but also to the average fan at home. And then they're saying, wait a second, you know, they are better than I thought. It's, you know, that perspective mm -hmm. completely changes. Yes. Let, let me tune in and watch this and see yep. what they're doing. Uh, Cause I think the products there, and I, I think that the, 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 when Michelle, we won that was it, she won the open at yeah, Pinehurst, she did. if I remember right, a number of years ago, I thought that that was kind of where, where I saw the LPJ has peaked so far uh, that, that as far as the viewership and the numbers of people who are following that and I, part of it, as I thought about that was obviously Michelle yep. was a superstar whether she lived up to her potential, someone can argue that or not, but she was a superstar. Still, and a still, still is, still moves uh, the needle. Well I, yes. And as well as the other ladies who were playing, but it, so th there's a number of factors and, but I, I was very curious to, to hear yours. And at least I was in some ways uh, yep. on the right path to, to having my theory be somewhat. Yeah, correct. for sure. Uh, and, and, you know, you're, you're not wrong in having, uh, I mean, you talk about wanting favorites to win. Um, I think golf is so weird in that media. I mean, we like to talk about the underdogs and we like to talk about, you know, those stories about the come from behind, you know, battling against all odds kind of winners. But really, people don't want to see that. They want to have their champions be champions. They want to see their favorites win. Like you want to see Rory, you want to see John Rahm win, you want to see those players win. In the same way as you want to see Nelly Corder win week after week after week. You want a dominant player, or even Jin Young Ko, or even whoever it is. It doesn't matter where they're from. You just need a dominant winner so that people can then be like either root for them to win or root for somebody to beat them. It gives that, it gives that dynamics, <laughs> you know, that, that you need that where, where there's too much uncertainty with who's winning and who's losing. It, it just, it, I don't know. People, people don't have an invested interest when they don't know who to root for. It's. Uh... I, I think the PGA Tour went through that, and until recently, when when you've got either Rory, Scotty Scheffler, or uh, John Rahm, that that you you think that one of those three is going to win every week, and, and it seems like one of the, and, uh, them is is up there. Yeah. I think the NBA, uh, the post Jordan era, and, and Le LeBron didn't seem to to lift that you can just tell by the ratings on, on television. Uh, so I, I think it's a sport wide thing yep. as we're yep. discussing superstar power to, to carry a sport and grow yep. it more so than it is. Uh, and, but again, it is that the dynamic for the ladies tour is different where as we discussed, you know, you, you have the, f the family aspect mm -hmm. and it, it, as you develop to become a superstar, I think Lorena Cho is a prime example. Yep. I mean, she retired at, at the, peak of her career she did. so it i think it, it, that that that's a that's a stronger uh thing pushing back against a ladies tour on becoming uh exponentially larger or more well, it's, it's harder to do because you've got to you know you've got to get your wins in early and get them in early and quick mm -hmm. your your broadcast career so you you as we're jumping around and <laughs> again, my, my linear uh, progression on, on this show. It works for my brain. Uh, someone's EKG. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just sit there and I, I just kind of write down and read on people and watch videos. And then all of a sudden the, the morning of the show, I usually write down a bunch of things I remember. And then I just run mm. with, with whatever it is. It, it keeps it more uh, interesting. And then I just ask questions. I don't sit there and outline everything. Uh, I tried that. It didn't work very well, at least mm. for my mental state. Um, but you, 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 you had segued as, as your career was, you, you were finding it more difficult to be a mom and just did, didn't want to have that struggle anymore. So you segued around 2013 yep. and 14 to, to be a commentator and, and for the golf channel. What uh, was it? As I have always seen play, people do that. Jerry being one, uh, Mark Lai being one, uh, uh, 
Tom mm-hmm. Byram being one. I, I watch these players, David Faraday, of course. I always sit there and wonder, the, the, and through my own mind, I say the first time doing that has got to be mm-hmm. one of the most nerve wracking moments because it's like you're out there and you're, you're viewing it completely different and you want to say something, but you don't want to offend your friends or get them, make them look bad. So how do you, how did you walk that line uh, in in the early stages of of that? So I I think that there's always a, even for people that struggle with the filter, there's always a filter that, that is, that goes on in your head. And my filter has always been, if somebody said this about me, would it, would I have found it a fair comment? And, and all, and, and this kind of goes through your head in a split second. Like it's, if it's a fair comment and, and you know, like deep down in your, deep down in your being, you, you know, if it's a fair comment or not, you know, that you just get that feeling. And, um, and so you say it or you don't. I've fallen foul of a couple of people with some things that I've said. Um, but they've always said from a personal feeling, like if they had been said about me, I would have been like, fair, it's a fair cop. You know, I've got to hold my hands up. Okay, you got me. Um, but they, they didn't take it that way, which is obviously their prerogative. But I always try and smooth things over afterwards but i'm not going to shy away from saying something that, that if i if, that if i feel passionately about i'm going to say it sometimes you sometimes it just blah, like it's out there and you're like oh okay it's out there now um <laughs> but it's you know you, you but there is that filter that, that goes on in your head like you, you have to be true to to the audience and you have to be true to yourself and who you are um because People can smell it out a mile away. You watch, you know, when, when somebody's mm-hmm. not telling you the full story or the full picture. People at home know. I know if it, if I'm not telling the full picture, um, and then I, then I, then I hate it if I, if I've glossed over something that I needed to, to dive into a little bit more. Um, but there's always that that line that you walk, um, and and sometimes they're really good friends of yours, and and it and it's, and it and it and it hurts you to see them hurting at times as well. And, and I think that you can always broach, broach those things from a place of empathy. And I think things tend to go over a lot better if you, if you can approach it that way. I, I had, um, I was one of the few who, I'm, I'm not going to say I enjoyed listening to Johnny Miller, but I, I found him very interesting li- listening to his commentary. And he, he was, he had a very unique way Obviously, <laughs> some people out there probably laughing. Unique is an interesting term to use to describe Johnny Miller. But I, as I got into it more, when Brandel came along, I, I was a defender of Brandel. I don't agree with a lot of what he, or some of what he says now, in particular about Liv. Um, not that I'm pro Liv, and you know Jerry and I yeah. talked a lot about that. I, I'm I'm pro golf. I'm not anti Liv. I'm pro golf. But um, and I it, going going way back when I was a kid and played a lot of basketball, Dick Vitale was, was the announcer. And and the reason that I realized that, that I like they, they weren't cookie yeah. cutter and, and they just did things different. So it was somewhat of a breath of fresh air. Obviously Johnny was sometimes difficult to take, but I, I was always curious because th- th- those are Faraday obviously is in a yeah. class all by himself. Um, but I always wondered that, uh, that making the transition to where there are a lot of your friends and, and you've, played by you know with them and you've been to dinner yep. and you, you've hung out and to, to to be able to say something about them but it, that what you say makes complete and total sense is I, th- I think as well I'm in a I'm in a good spot now I mean obviously you know I am fairly experienced with life um, I'm older uh, I've gone through the whole gambit of everything you know married divorced um, children you know, no children before, children now, uh, winning, losing, Solheim Cups, Curtis Cups, winning, losing, team things, you know, the whole, I've experienced life in general. I've lived away from home, lived in other countries. I've traveled. I've experienced a whole lot of life, good and bad. And I think it, and I think that that helps with my commentary because I have that experience behind me. And I think that the players know that I have that experience behind me. 
And I think that they generally, they trust me that I'm going to do right by them too, in a way that is fair uh, to the game of golf and to, to them, as I said, from a, from a perspective of, of being empathetic to what they're going through. Um, you can say the right things and, and be critical, but in a, in a kind kind of manner, it, not in a harsh, throw them under mm-hmm. the bus way, because, because ultimately golf's hard. You know, and everybody's trying their trying their ass off out there. They're trying hard. Like they're not trying to, um, they're not trying to mess it up. They're not trying to lose. They're they're trying hard to win, uh, and sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And so the, the, there's always a, a a way to put things and a way to phrase it. And I and I always look to Judy Rankin as as say some as my mentor somebody who i've looked up to within the industry for for how she goes about how she says says things like she always has a, a fabulous way of, of putting it that is absolutely on point but isn't but doesn't completely slam them at the same time like you know exactly what she means mm-hmm. but it's like like it's like your your mother or your grandmother telling you like it's just it's just a nice way it's just a just a the right way to say it and uh and i and i like to you know hope that i can get even half as close to to the way she she did it but uh as i said i'm glad that i have the experience of life behind me to be able to talk talk about golf the way i do how do you like it's easy to to know that you, you, know, you take a lesson you have to practice your your iron game or your driver, your short game, your putting, whatever. How do you go about developing the skill of learning how to do <laughs> golf commentary? Because you, you have a very unique way of being able to say, not talk about it too much and get your point across very distinctly and, and very. I, I think, you know, a lot of it is, has been reps, you know, I mean, it's like everything and then you practice it and you do it. I, I came from, I, I initially did radio. Uh, I went out for BBC radio five. And uh, I went to cover the open in 2007, just after I had my son. And so I was able to go out with them. And so I learned a lot about um, how they would do things and and they would go out in pairs. So um, you'd have a host and then you'd have me to provide color. So the host would kind of tee you up with something. I would chime in with a little bit of color and then he would send it off to something else. So you get used to dealing it with little short sound bites of it. But for me, I think you know, there's an understanding of how the show works and, and knowing that the producer is only going to stay with you for a certain amount of time. So I try and get in, I try and pack in as much information as I can in a shorter space of time. And, and I prioritize what's the most important thing here that people at home need to know. And, 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 I, and, I, and I pick my moments for it. There are sometimes there's so much else that I want to say, but I'm like, I ain't got time for it. It's, it's just going to have to be buried. But but then that comes down to having trust in the rest of my of the people that I work with that they're going to pick up on what I've said. So I know that Morgan and Tom and Grant in the booth in the booth will be able to pick up on something that I've said. So say I'm calling the tape shop. I have seven seconds to say blah 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 whatever I'm saying, and then I lay out because then I know that Morgan's going to jump in and say. Yeah, Karen, that's because of, you know, da 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 because da, now she has time to jump in and fill in the holes. And I think part of part of doing of, of a good broadcast is is me being able to say something that kind of tees the booth up as well to elaborate and to do something else, to allow a, a, a more rounded conversation about something that's going on on the course, not just about me. Did, did did moving into the the commentary did, uh, and then allowing you to to spend more time with your family uh, did, did it, it reinvigorate your your curiosity as the golf game did as you you were learning to play and develop that 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 skill was there any newness to to the commentary uh, <laughs> that that you're like wow this is kind of cool L- let me try this the same way you would if you're playing with a your seven iron what if I do this and you hit a shot and oh okay that let me tweak it and what if I do this was did, did that uh, somewhat um, the nerves are very real don't get me wrong like that I was so nervous mm. 
and I'm learning all the time. Like I'm like it's um I, like you try. I try and perfect what I the way I the way I talk about golf. The way I try to perfect my golf game. Okay, how can I be better? What can I do more mm. of? And and I know it as soon as I've said something that comes out of my mouth, I'll kick myself if it's not quite right. And it, or it's, it's sometimes for me, it's as simple as it's not like you can pull it. No, back. it's like oh, it's done. Uh, and there are times when, when I, you know, I think God, I'm talking too fast. I've got to slow my, I've got to slow down. Um, I've got to, you know, make sure that my words are coming out a little clearer. And there are all kinds of things that I think that I can do better. Um, you know, use, you know, and think about a million different things to say the same thing. And, and the one thing that I would say has really helped me. Um, I talked earlier about having ADD and being dyslexic. A lot of the times I would, I would be writing something and I, I didn't have a clue how to spell it. Like I didn't have a clue how to put the word that I wanted to put down in, in writing. So I'd ha- I would always have to think of another word to put in its place. So I've, I've always been used mm-hmm. to thinking of different ways of saying things because I, because I didn't know how to write the word down that I wanted to write down. So I would have to think of something else. So I think all my life I've kind of been preparing to do this. This is kind of, I feel like this is where I've always supposed to be, like talking about golf. And I've been fortunate enough to be good at it, that people want me to do it. You know, one of my favorites is that when the Golf Channel was growing and they used to play a lot of European uh, tour golf on, I, I used to love just listening to Renton Lake. Mm-hmm. It's like he, he would say just enough to, to give you all the information you need, but enough to, to just make you want to continue yeah. listening. And I, I thought he was phenomenal at doing that i I think i think you have to have a a knowledge that uh, and you again you have to realize that your your words are are not are not not the star of the show uh you know the 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 people Mm -hmm. playing golf they're they're the stars that what what you see them do is 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 the most important thing all you can do is add something that people can't see something that that people are you know might not be aware of or, or that might make people at home go Oh, I didn't think about that. Those are the moments that we, you know, that we that we live for, and and that's what we strive for. And and sometimes it's the, it's a short, sharp little jab with a few words that make all the difference. Do, as, as you and Jerry, as you sit around the dinner table, or you, you sit on the back patio and watch the sunset, do you ever sit there and, and just talk, commentating? Do I, you ever? I did. I learned a lot. Uh, I actually not, not criticize, but help one another out. I actually, I learned a lot from him. Um, I, I tagged along with him, listened to him, watched him do what he does. Always marvelled at how uh, effortlessly he made uh, commentary look. Um, it, it was uh, it was like he he would just he just woke up, he had a yard, just put his hand, and it just stroll around the course, say brilliant stuff, and do brilliant interviews, and that was it. I'm like, <laughs> and then I realised that he was actually putting work into it, and he was taking notes and doing stuff, and I'm like, oh, now I, I've actually, I see you actually working at it, because I just assumed that he just, he woke up, and all of a sudden, he was just naturally brilliant, but he actually does, does actually work at it quite a bit too, but um, the the one thing that people that are good in this industry have is they're very they they think very fast on their feet. They're very witty. They think fast on their feet. They've got an answer for everything. And, um, you know, I, I, I quickly realized that, that uh, from watching him, that, that, that I needed to be more, think faster on my feet and, uh, and walk slower. <laughs> <laughs> does that, does that give you the time to kind of put your thoughts together? It does. It absolutely does. Like I, I'm, I'm a maniac. Like I, I'm like a thousand miles an hour, and he's like really chill and just, you know. <laughs> so he, he kind of just takes the edge off everything. But he's always, you know, there's always little tips like, oh, you know, make sure that that when you're asking questions, you know, interview techniques, or you could have, you could have said it a little better if you had said this, or, or if you had asked it this way, it could have been better, or, you know, never, you know, never anything, you know major that would make you feel bad or anything but it would just be you know this mm-hmm. this this would make it sound better or you know when you were talking about that shot it you know you might have done this but uh, it, in all fairness the actual on course stuff is he's always just kind of that's fine but it's just more the interview things that that he would help me with because honestly that's the yeah, bit that i that i am 
that I have always been the most fearful of um, because I've always been used to being asked questions as opposed to posing the questions, but I'm starting to enjoy them now. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Completely yeah. Completely different. You know, I, I watched Amanda Balionis and I don't remember her married name. So if Amanda, if you hear this, please don't get mad at me, but I, I've watched her. Yes. Her, her d develop. She has come a long way. Uh, and I don't, I don't know her, what her background was and uh, how she got to where she did, but I thought, I always thought that she yep. had a great personality, but her, her ability to, and, and skill in asking questions has gotten exponentially better in my opinion, as I watch the telecast regularly. And I'm like, she's really, really getting good. And it's nice to see and, and be able to watch somebody's yeah. development. That, um, not, not that no, she was no. ever bad by any means. She, she's just gotten really, really that, good. But look, at, but notice how comfortable she is. You know, that's the, that's the real key. Mm -hmm. It's like, she's very comfortable talking to to the players they're very comfortable talking to her she knows now that she, she's not worried about the questions she she has an initial line of questioning that she goes with and then she lets the players guide her wherever the next one's going like she doesn't have a, a string of questions that she has to ask that she has that's in her head that she wants to ask and i think that the more fluid the interviews are the, the better they the better they are for the viewers mm -hmm. If you could go get in a time machine and, and you could go back to the golf course you grew up on and your dad was out tending to the course and, and you were there on the practice range, if you could walk up to the to the young teenage Karen, what what would you tell her? I would tell her that um, I'm going to plug my phone in. OK, I would tell her that. Um, not to stress because everything's going to be just fine. Keep working hard, do exactly what you're going to do. Um, don't ever doubt yourself or your abilities. Have faith that uh, you are good and that you and that you just keep working. I, I think that I, I didn't believe I was as good as I was. I, I didn't believe that, that I could be a champion. Um, I always, I had always hoped that I could be, but I didn't believe it really. And, uh, and obviously I was, mm -hmm. and, uh, and people always tell me now that, oh, you were so good. You were this and that. I'm like, what, where, what, why didn't I ever see that? Why didn't I believe it? And I think so many people that play golf, uh, think that way. They don't believe in themselves. They don't trust themselves. And I think that's what I would tell myself. That's, uh, yeah, that'd be some very, very good advice. Uh, as someone who spent almost their entire life in and around golf, is there anything that you see that surprises you anymore? Mm, not really. I don't think. Um, I I don't think that anything does surprise me. I I, I think thing there are some things that I get disappointed by. Uh, I get disappointed in how much pressure some parents put on their kids. I get disappointed with the, with the, with the social media criticisms of, of players and things. Sometimes mm -hmm. I get, I, I'm disappointed with stuff like that. Um, I'm a, I think maybe surprised at how fluid the golf swing has become. I mean, when I grew up, Nick Faldo's, uh, you know, keep your feet still, very slow, rigid swing. You know, I mean, it was a beautiful looking right. swing, but all the lines had to be perfect. Um, I think most days have long gone. Everything's all about crushing the ball as far as you can crush it. And, you know, Matthew will swing. I mean, if you'd go back 30 years, Matthew will swing. People would be like, <laughs> you know, the head would have exploded thinking about yeah, it. I, it's, it's, somebody, somebody would yeah, have ruined him. Absolutely. I think, I don't think he, he would ever became nope. who he did. And, and I, and I think that the whole distance thing has, has kind of snuck up on everybody and, and here we are now dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's very interesting time in golf. As I'm sure 30, 50, 70 years ago, it was something interesting in that era. But uh, it, this is a very unique and interesting time in our society and in yeah. golf in general. And it, it's, it's just like, how is this going to change? And then next thing you know, I mean, it, and I think just society and in, in, in general and mankind will, everything will direct itself and work itself out. It always, I mean, been on this planet for how many thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of years and things just seem to yep. work out so things will work themselves out 
You ready to do some fun? Sure, let's do it. I mean, we talked pretty serious about a lot of different things. Let's have some right. little fun here at the end, and I'll, I'll let you go. I know I'm probably way past <laughs> my, my time. My, my phone, probably have my phone's like low battery, low battery. <laughs> um, the the first one, the last one, everybody gets. So I, I'll uh, and I, I kind of try to customize it to each person. So you're you're back in the Solheim Cup. If they were doing the walk up song like they do now to the first hole. For, for all the, oh. the big team events what what would what would they be playing when uh-huh. you were walking up? i hadn't even thought about that i'm i'm very much a fair weather song whatever whatever's on my favorite on my playlist is uh is what's gonna is what's gonna be playing oh my god who knows <laughs> it's okay. like it could be anything i've got such an eclectic such an eclectic what, whatever whatever kind exactly of moment, exactly <laughs> Uh, if they made a movie about your life, they said, Karen, we, we Hollywood came, comes a calling and, and Steven Spielberg says, we have a, we, we heard this podcast and you have an extremely interesting life. We want to make a movie about it. Who, who, who would you want to play you or who's going to play mm. you? Now that's really interesting because do you want a really great actor or do you want somebody with really great hair? You know, that's, you know, great <laughs> hair. I go Je- Jennifer that's Aniston. I mean, that would be she really cute, great hair. Yeah, I'll go with her. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, that, that's a yeah. yeah. It's hard to argue with that one. I mean, a lot. I, I know. I know a lot of yeah, guys. Yeah, see, be that's watching. perfect. I'm all for that. I'm sure Jerry would be fine with that too. Um. <laughs> Although he he might go with T your, T Leone. He might he'd, he'd prefer I was T Leone. Yeah. I yeah. Okay, we go work. with her. Uh, your fa- your favorite purchase under a thousand dollars. Oh, so many. What if it's just slightly over? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll bend my most recent per- well, it wasn't mine, Jerry. I've got a big. It's a big birthday. It's, it's a big number coming up. Like it's a special. I turn fifty in a few de- in a few weeks, and Jerry brought me a coffee machine, coffee maker, and it is the most fabulous coffee mm-hmm. maker. It's one that does lattes and macchiatos and all the rest of yes. it. I feel like a complete influencer using it. Um, so that has been like, like my best purchase, but there are other things like that. That was, so I mean, that was fabulous. But if you want like something cheap, uh, one of the most fun things that I got was, uh, was little caps that go on, on your cans of soda so that you can, so that when I'm riding around drinking my, my diet coke on the golf course doing commentary i don't have to worry about a bit about a bee going in it or a, a wasp because it's got a because you can seal it up again and they're like three dollars on amazon so <laughs> the the uh i have a breville espresso oh uh, machine, there you go uh, the express and i i got it and, and that was the genesis of that question so very cool that that uh you use that exact I do, example i do uh, it was when I went to South Africa. The, the coffee was so good there. When I came home, I said, I, I, I got to go get one of these things. A uh, couple more. Do you, which, which do you, which describes you more? You hate to lose or you love to win? Um, I've had to turn my light off. Yeah. Sorry. Let me plug my thing in. Cause literally okay. my phone is dying on me. Let's see. If you need to plug okay. it in, go ahead. I'm all, I'm all done now. So um, I hate to lose. First and foremost, hating to lose is, is the big one for me. Okay. Yep. Uh, if you were to change one rule in golf, what would it be? One rule in golf, uh, the preferred light rule. So lift, clean, and place. Uh, I do not like lift, clean, and... You would get rid of it or, or, or have it more? Less. So not, not a club length. I would have it a scorecard length. Like I hate the fact that you can move it at a club length. When I was playing, I used to love it. It was great. It was great. You can move it a club length. You can get perfect driving range lie, completely change the characteristics of it. Yeah. But as I, as I watch it now, it's, it's, the game of golf is about the undulations and the different kinds of lies and the slopes and playing different things. So you shouldn't be able to move it that far. I would agree. Well, one club is, especially <laughs> at the skill level the players have now with the technology and the everything else it, it, yeah one club is like no that's making it easier yeah uh, uh, uh you you have played around the world 
what is your favorite course that you've ever played? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously I'm partial to Sunningdale because that's where I won the, the Women's Open. Um, <laughs> but I like Port Rush. Port Rush is an amazing, amazing course. And, and I enjoyed Marion as well. Very cool. Yeah, it'd be hard, hard for anybody <laughs> to argue with those, those choices. Uh, a couple more. The most, the most used app on your phone. I'm ashamed to say it's probably Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. be a lot of people. I'm ashamed to say. It. Well, it could be worse. It could be TikTok, I suppose, because it, it, I don't even have that one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, and then the last one. Everyone gets first in the last one. In, in your opinion, and this could be anybody, uh, the greatest of all time golfer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm only I'm only going to go with Tiger Woods, and I say that because I've seen him up close, personal in his prime, playing Tiger Woods golf, and I have mm -hmm. been absolutely blown away by some of the things he does with a golf ball. And I've seen all all kinds of, you know, all, of the world's best, you no know, modern day best. Didn't get a chance to see Nicholas play in his prime, or Hogan or Mickey Wright. Um, I did see Annika. Annika was pretty impressive too. But Tiger Woods, I mean, watching what he does with a golf ball, not just the, 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 the shots, but the, the chips, like like putting hook spin and slice spin on chips just so it you know goes into the slope and doesn't take so much slope. And just the little things that he did with his game just absolutely floored me every time I watched him play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he it, it's amazing that and and he just continues to get want to get better at different aspects of his game, and it's like he, no. he just doesn't stop. It's just every day a yep. little bit more, a little bit more. Karen, it's been a treat. I can't thank you enough. I was again as we talked before in the pre-show. I was worried about <laughs> what am I going to ask her and what am I going to talk about. And here, here we are. We we blew through two hours it's like it was almost easy. Like it was nothing, it's easy. Easy. I've really enjoyed this, and I think that everybody that's listening uh, to this is going to enjoy it as well. No problem, Thank Pete. Thanks for having me on.